Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Rupert Nash, um, and I'm going to give this virtual tutorial. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Or if anyone can't hear me well, please say so. Sorry, um, PowerPoint has just decided to close the first set of slides, which I was trying to start. OK, uh, yeah, so uh, this is me. Uh, my name is Rupert Nash. I'm one of the application consultants here at EPCC. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, scientific Python, or uh, really in general, why someone who does computational science of any sort might like to consider using Python uh, and how you'd go about learning more and a very, very brief introduction to the language Python and some of the most important libraries for doing numerical computation with it. Um, yeah, so these slides are reusable. These were not written by me, so I, uh, I can't take credit or the blame for that. Um, they were put together by uh, Andy Turner and Arno Froome here at EPCC, and very, they base theirs on various other people's original slides, I believe. So there'll be some credits throughout this as appropriate. Uh, and the Archer whole help desk system, sponsored by various people, hosted by us at EPCC at the University of Edinburgh. So just in general, what um, what we're doing when we're doing scientific computer is this rough process here. So we generate some data. So this is either your simulation on Archer or another large HPC machine. Um, and let's not forget experiments. Uh, you know, um, various big science things generate vast amounts of data. And then you process this data in some way to try and generate some um, relevant results from these. And then you'll often visualize them, whether it's in a plain graph or something a bit fancier. Uh, to try and get some understanding of these, and then you know you have to tell the world about it. So you have to make your nice graphs uh, uh, ready to go in your paper, or put on a presentation like this. So why why Python? So basically, Python uh, is a very simple language to learn, um, and it's also a very readable language if. Even if you are a physicist like me, you can write very readable code in Python relatively straightforward, which is important because a lot of us are self-taught programmers. Um, and it's uh, syntax is quite clear. Um, it's not entirely unlike Fortran, but well, that's a bit of a, a debatable claim there. Um, it's also uh, a very flexible language, so you can write code in the way that is best suited to your understanding of the problem at hand. Um, it's also got a very broad set of scientific computing functionalities um, available. So there are a large number of numerical and scientific libraries, um, several of the most important which uh, I will mention in the upcoming slides. Um, it's got some very powerful plotting uh, facilities, um, which I'll mention matplotlib mainly. Um, and it's remarkably easy to uh, interface to existing code, whether that's Fortran, C, or C++. Um, as well as the fact that you can uh, interact with the interpreter in real time, so you can play with your results uh, by typing commands into a shell window and plot them, or print parts of them and analyze them on the fly, um, as well as the more traditional scripting interface where you write a file that describes your program. Um, and last but not least, it is uh, fully open source, so uh, the source code to the language itself is available uh, uh, if you want to hack on anything, and most of the libraries that you want to use are also open source. 
So a quick list of some of the more useful packages. Um, PyPython, which is a sort of enhanced interactive shell for Python. Um, Matplotlib, which is a plotting uh, library for both 2D and 3D plots. If you go to the Matplotlib website and look at the gallery there, you can find a lot of very uh, good uh, plots, which may give you inspirations on how to plot the data that you want, that you have at hand. Um, next is NumPy, which is um, tools for manipulating numerical arrays efficiently. So this is uh, an, a very important task in most uh, numerical computing applications, and NumPy really is the foundation library for a lot of the um, other scientific uh, packages that you'll find. SciPy is a slightly higher level package that builds on NumPy. Um, it's got a lot of common algorithms implemented, so it's got a full interface to BLAST and LAPAC libraries, Fourier transforms, optimization, all sorts of other things. f pi is for interfacing uh, external code to Python, most specifically uh, Fortran, but you can also interface to C, existing C code through it. And finally on this list is MPI for Pi, which is uh, MPI for Python. So the message passing interface that you're used to using on Archer and any other uh, clusters. So yeah, interactive or programming. So uh, like I mentioned before, you can use it as an interactive tool um, when you're producing simple plots or quickly analyzing some data. Um, and this IPython shell adds some existing, adds some additional functionality to the basic interpreter that you get just by running Python on your shell's command line. And of course, you can also write a script in a file um, or um, to reuse that logic again and again for your program. And you can interface that to um, other compiled code. Okay, so just a little more about IPython. Um, it extends the standard Python shell with a number of things. So you get tab completion, which is very nice. You can get interactive help, well, more in-depth interactive help than the standard Python shell gives you. Built-in debugging and profiling, which is obviously great when you're writing your uh, code the first time. You can paste uh, code snippets in from websites much more easily. So this is important for Python because you may be aware that in Python, indentation is significant and often this does not cope well with copy and paste. So IPython's extensions to do with pasting are very useful. And you can also save your session. So if you've been analyzing the data and you've produced a great graph that you want to save later, you can just have IPython save the entire log of your uh, shell so far so you can get back to that uh, exact graph quite easily. Uh, and if you just type quickref within an IPython shell, this will give you a, a summary of its capabilities. OK, so that's the end of the first part. Uh, I'll just switch to the second set of slides, if it will let me. I don't seem to want to. There we go. Intro to Python, that's what I was looking for. Um, Chris, do you have it on the screen? Sorry, my uh, display has gone funny. No, I'm having a technical problem here. I'm, I do apologise. Uh, yeah, so I guess we're going to have to do this this way. Let me see if I can make that a bit bigger. Yeah, there's not really reception here, I'm afraid. Um, right, OK. Uh, can anyone not see that reasonably well? If you could just tell me in the chat, please. OK, thanks, Bruce. Um, 
Right, so uh, yeah, Python was created in the 90s by a chap called Guido Van Rossum. Uh, um, and yes, it started off quite simply, but uh, lots, and, uh, lots of other people started using it. It's been driven by a desire to provide a, a very programmer friendly alternative. Uh, well, it says here for, for C to speed up application development, but I think it was more intended as a replacement for other scripting languages uh, initially. Um, but it did take inspiration from an earlier um, interactive programming environment and language called ABC. Um, and it wasn't really intended for scientific computing, unlike uh, something like Fortran. It's more of a general programming uh, language. Um, but now it's become a very popular language. Um, according to this, it's uh, the most popular first programming language at the top 39 US computer science departments, um, which I didn't know. But uh, it's all, I did know that it's been used by a large number of very uh, big uh, IT related companies um, and finance. Um, version 3 appeared uh, probably about one and a half to, you know, it was quite a few years ago now. Uh, but it's still not the very widely used. Most people are still using version 2. And this is mainly because uh, version 3 breaks uh, the backwards compatibility with um, the version 2 series of scripts. Um, and talking about uh, sort of uh, science and engineering. So there are several main uses of it. Um, first, as a sort of workflow environment for data analysis and visualization. So uh, setting up your jobs uh, before you run them, uh, launching them on the remote resource, uh, getting the data back, analyzing that data, running that through a visualization uh, uh, pipeline so that you can see your results. Um, second, there's some sort of glue code, an interface language for um, dealing with all the boring, uh, fiddly, around the edge parts of your, like your simulation before delegating the heavy numerical work to a compiled language like C or Fortran. Um, and some examples of this are uh, Fluidity or ASE. Um, thirdly, there's the sort of rapid prototyping approach. Because Python is very programmer friendly, you can write your code in the way that seems best to the programmer uh, very efficiently. Um, you can create a functioning, but perhaps uh, too slow version of your algorithm quite quickly. Uh, and then you can figure out how best to implement that in a faster compiled language. And people also do their entire simulations in uh, Python. But generally, you can't do that if it's a, in the HPC end of things, because the performance hit for using an interpreted language would be too high. So performance does is continuing to improve, but there are, and there are a few Python codes, a few codes that are 100% Python. Uh, it's not really used anywhere for any heavy numerics. Um, I believe that GPOR example is actually incorrect, unfortunately. Um, um, so characteristics of the language itself. It's a very high level language uh, compared to C. So people, some people uh, describe C as platform independent assembler, which is uh, that's a bit harsh, but Python is definitely higher level than that. It's got a very simple syntax. It's quite readable, uh, so that allows you to write a shorter program. But you do sacrifice uh, some performance due to all the overhead of the abstraction uh, that goes into the language. Um, but the advantage of this is that you know the development time is reduced. And since the time to a solution is the time to develop the program and then run it, this can, in some cases, win. Uh, and you get an answer faster. Python is a completely uh, general purpose programming language uh, um, like all the others that I mentioned there. Uh, so you know, any problem that you can solve in one of them, you can express in Python, even if the runtime may not be desirable. Uh, it also supports, but doesn't insist upon, uh, many different programming styles. So you can do object-oriented, procedural, functional, imperative, whatever uh, style of programming is appropriate for you or uh, the problem at hand, uh, Python will generally support us in some way. Um, and again, open source, which is important. 
So the interpretive way that the language works is you don't you don't have a separate compilation step like you do with your C or Fortran programs. Um, the code is interpreted by an executable called the interpreter, um, which is generally just uh, Python, all lowercase, when you come to run it. Uh, and this script is contained in a file that ends in .py uh, that's executed by the interpreter uh, as shown below. So when Arno ran at you, his cat, which is printing the contents of the file, just contains hello world uh, as an argument to the print function. And then when you execute that script by giving it to the Python interpreter, it just prints hello world. So there we have everyone's favorite first program. So if you don't give an uh, input file to the interpreter, it will enter um, an interactive mode. So it will just sit there waiting for you to type some commands in it. So when you execute the Python interpreter, it prints out some headers telling you exactly which version of Python it is. And then you can type in some commands such as uh, the print function and giving it the argument hello world and it will print hello world. So the Python shell there is good for exploring Python functionality directly without needing to write your code into a script and then run it and uh, you can directly examine the variables by printing their value. Excuse me. So this is really good for sort of incremental progressive style development or rapid prototyping of simple objects and so on. So if you have any errors, debugging information is printed within the shell, so it will print a trace back of the, uh, all the function call, all the, the chain of functions, uh, the call stack uh, to where the error occurs. And then once you've figured out how to make uh, what you want happen, you can uh, save that code in uh, a script, uh, a .py file. So if we compare this uh, just briefly to MATLAB, it's not um, entirely dissimilar, especially if you use IPython um, to something like MATLAB. Indeed, IPython has a special mode called PyLab mode, which tries to imitate MATLAB as closely as possible, including making available uh, quite similar plotting commands through matplotlib. Um, so as well as having the a large range of scientific libraries like these other commercial uh, interactive packages. Uh, Python is much more easily extendable. Uh, and as it's, since it's got popular, um, it's sort of calls a uh, virtuous circle. So more and more packages are becoming available because there are already many packages available. And Python has become, some may, may argue, the, the preferred workflow shell for tying various disparate bits of scientific software together. Okay, so a very quick run through of some of the fundamentals of the language now. So um, the data types. So all variables in Python are dynamically typed. So every object has the same fundamental type, which is a Python object. And you don't specify explicitly whether a variable is an integer, a string, or some other object. The, the type of the variable is only available dynamically at runtime. Um, based on the uh, referenced value, reference object to that variable. So here we've got uh, set it below in this snippet of code, x is set to uh, float, which is what has a value of 1.0, and the variable my name is set to the value of another variable called Arno, or perhaps Arno meant to put it in quotes to make it a string. And then y is set to be the result of adding a string and a float, which, uh, depending on exactly what types things are, uh, the operators may give different return types. OK, and the, these next slides are uh, being supplied by some guys at CSC in Helsinki. Sorry, I'm not going to try and pronounce their names to any Finns in the audience. Um, yeah, so a quick rundown of the numerical types. So we have integers, uh, floats, complex numbers. They're the basic uh, built-in types in Python. Um, 
So integers are just expressed as you know uh, numbers. You can also give them as hex, binary, or octal inputs, depending on the syntax. Look on the web if you care. Floats, floating point numbers are given either by including a decimal point or using scientific notation with the usual e, uh, separate the exponent and mantissa. Uh, complex numbers are given by um, uh, well, at least one of the parts having a, a J in it, um, J indicating the imaginary component, so square root of minus one. So when you add that to the first floating point number, the return type is a complex because uh, the result is promoted to a complex. So you've got all the usual basic mathematical operators that uh, obey the usual uh, uh, association rules. Um, the type conversions are always implicit. Uh, so if you add a float and a um, an integer, you will always get a float back. These rules are defined and documented on the Python website. Uh, the, I'd also just point out that the Python uh, documentation at python.org is quite good. Uh, so it's a useful resource for learning the uh, finer fine print of all the rules. Um, again, there's worth pointing out you should be careful with integer division so 2 over 5 as integers will give you 0 because there are uh, you will only get an integer back okay strings strings are enclosed by either single quotes or double quotes they are mean exactly the same uh, to Python when they're used as delimiters so there are a few examples and some strings given below so a very simple string you just include that S2 is exactly the same value as S1. So if you were to compare them for equality, that would give you true. Uh, S3 uh, says this isn't so simple. It isn't so simple because it contains single quotes within it, but it's using double quotes to delimit it. So that's quite easy to see. The, the fourth one is this complex string. Uh, it is the opposite to S3. It's using uh, single quotes to delimit the entire string. So within that string, uh, double quotes are just any other uh, character. And the final one is a multi-line string. So if you use three quotes of either type to open it, uh, you can have multi-line strings that include uh, multi-line strings that can include any characters you like except for three uh, double quotes to close it or three single quotes if you opened it single quotes. Uh, in the chat window, I don't know if you've seen, Andy has pointed out that uh, Python 3 integer division has changed and it returns a float by default. And if you want the old behavior, use the double slash operator to tell the interpreter that you really do mean by uh, integer division. Thanks, Andy. Um, so the plus and multiplication operators are also defined for strings. Um, so strings can be combined with the plus and repeated using the multiplication. The integer has to follow the string in this case. I think it was the other way around. It is an error, but don't believe me without checking that. Um, OK, so let's talk about some data structures now. Um, so the sort of uh, key data structures in Python are lists, tuples, and dictionaries. Um, dictionaries aren't mentioned here for some reason, but Perhaps they should be. Uh, there are no arrays built in to Python. So by an array, I mean a fixed size list of uh, homogeneous type. OK, so a quick summary of lists. Python lists are very dynamic uh, objects. They list items are indexed starting from 0. And the items within the list can be of any type. So you can mix strings and integers and whatever objects you like, files, uh, whatever relevant objects you have within your script. Uh, you can add new items at any place, the start, the end, the middle, wherever, and you can remove items from wherever you like. So we'll just show you a few examples of this on the slide here. So to define a list, you use uh, the square brackets. Uh, and as you can see, list one's got three, a string, an egg, a float, 6.1, and then an inch of seven. List two has 
its items as the integer 12, a list. So lists can contain other lists. And then two more integers. So to access uh, members of the list, elements of the list, you just use the square bracket syntax with uh, an integer. So this will be very familiar to C programmers. What will be less familiar is that you can use a negative number to index backwards from the end of the list. So minus one will give you the last item in the list, which is quite a useful idiom, and minus two will give you the second last, and so on, and so on. Uh, you can modify these items in place. So if in list one we set the second to last item to four, it will change uh, as shown at the bottom of the slide. Right, so we can add items to the list by using the append method. Um, so append will always add to the end of the list. So if we use the example there, which contains four integers, and we append 11, 11 ends up being the last item on the list. Insert is a method that will insert an, uh, an element at the given position. So insert 1 will insert 16 before element 1 of the list, remembering that we're zero index like a C programmer would be used to. Sorry, Fortran programmers. Uh, yeah, so there we go. We can, we can extend a list by, which is another method that um, accepts as its argument another list, and then that will extend the existing list with the elements of the other list. Right, and finally, um, addition and multiplication operators are defined for lists. So if you add two lists together, you will get back a third list that contains the elements in the expected order. And if you use multiplication, you will get uh, a certain num a new list which contains uh, the specified numbers of number of copies of the original list. Um, another thing that's worth that's uh, a sort of extension over C that may confuse some people, uh, but is also a very powerful feature, is it's possible to access slices of lists. So this is a subset of the elements within it. So if we define an element with six, a list with six elements, uh, the integers from zero to five, we can request that the interpreter create a new list by slicing the old one. So zero to two will give you the elements starting from and including zero up to but not including the second uh, number. So you separate these with colons. If you omit one of these numbers, it will assume the entire length of the list. So colon 2 is a synonym for 0 colon 2. So as you can see with the first couple of examples on the um, slide. Uh, and then the, the third example says, give me element 3 to the end of the list. Uh, the other thing to say is that the slicing syntax takes a third optional argument. Uh, which is the stride. So 0 to 6 in steps of 2, that means. So that will give you all the even elements. So elements 0, 2, 4, 6, so on. And if you choose a negative number, then it will stride backwards from the end of the array. Uh, yeah, and you can remove items with pop, which takes an optional argument of uh, the elements removed. If you omit the uh, index number, it will remove the last element in the list. OK, so tuples are the other important data type. So a tuple is a comma-separated uh, list of values. So the example gives here is t is assigned to the, the string a, comma, the integer 2. Is that your microphone? Sorry, I just had a bit of an echo on the line there. Uh, and then another integer. Um, so one of the most important differences between tuples and lists is that tuples are immutable. Once you create one, you cannot change it at all. This does not mean that a tuple cannot contain items that are mutable themselves. So if you had a tuple that contained a list, you could affect that list, and that would be reflected in the tuple. But you cannot change the size 
or the identity of the objects contained within the tuple. So this is sort of uh, indicated by this traceback here that's uh, printed, so it's saying type error tuple object does not support item assignments. Um, so dictionaries aren't mentioned here. Um, I'm just going to refer you to the uh, internet if you're interested in learning more. Basically, a dictionary is a map, an associative map between keys and values. So most commonly, people will use strings as the keys to a dictionary. So you can store anything you like, so an association between a key and a value. Uh, and they're a very important data structure within Python. Right, so variables. Um, it's important to note that all variables in Python are simply references or pointers to the underlying objects. So if you have a list that contains one, two, three, four, and then you assign another list to assign to another list from that variable, uh, L1 and L2 will be references to the exact same list. So if you modify the list through the variable L2, those changes will be reflected when you access the list through the variable L1. So this is uh, shown in this little example here, setting element zero of list two to zero, and then you print list one, this will be reflected here, and you can see that the first element is indeed zero. You can copy these lists by uh, slicing the entire list, so that's just using one colon to index it with no arguments. Uh, and then if you were to assign to list three, it will not affect list one or list two. OK, so uh, a few words about objects. So if you're familiar with object-oriented programming, uh, this will not be particularly interesting to you. But for those of you who are not, um, roughly speaking, an object is a sort of a bundle together of various data and behavior. So the behavior is uh, basically functions that act on objects of those type. Um, which are usually referred to in the object-oriented jargon as methods. So virtually, whenever you see an object followed by a dot, followed by a method, I mean, that's uh, what we're talking about. It's basically a function. And uh, I think I mentioned before that in Python, everything is an object. So strings and integers are objects. They have methods that you can call on them. And even um, functions are also objects. So you can uh, assign functions to variables, and you can call methods on those functions. So methods can, can, can but do not have to, modify the data contained within an object, or they can create new objects, or do anything uh, as a regular function could. OK, finally, for this part of the um, this set of slides and um, just mentioned standard library. So Python has a very large standard library that includes uh, modules and packages that can manipulate all sorts of data types and interact with other parts of your computer. So you can interface with the operating system. So you can do things like uh, list directories, modify files, create network connections, all that sort of thing. Got uh, some basic maths operations. So sine, cosine, square root, all that standard sorts of things. and some simple random number generators. Uh, there are tools for profiling performance measurement, uh, output formatting, um, and passing input as well, uh, data compression, accessing the internet or uh, other parts of the network, tools for multi-threading and multi-processing and logging, and many, many other things that may be relevant. So if you need to implement a data structure, uh, in your programming, check the standards library first. There are numerous uh, ones already implemented. And you can access uh, these packages by basically uh, loading a module to, into your code. This is done with the import keyword. So to import uh, the OS module, you would type import OS. Um, yeah, so I did mention before that uh, indentation is important to Python. This uh, talk is not really a detailed introduction to the syntax language, so I'll just refer you to the internet or other courses that uh, the ECSE 
may run. Right, so that's the end of set three. Set two, sorry. Set three uh, of slides is about NumPy. Let's try this one again. No, it's not working. Oh, I think I remember how to do this. Yeah, sorry, I think this is the Collaborate software not playing very well with um, my two monitor setup here. Uh, so I think I've figured this out. Okay, so Python um, doesn't provide arrays, as I mentioned before. It only provides lists and tuples. So the problem with lists is that they're slow for many algorithms. The reason that they're slow is because it contains an object of any type. Uh, and you have to go through the full Python machinery for dealing with dynamically typed objects to access any element and manipulate it any way. So this obviously includes a lot of overhead, checking the types of objects and so forth. Um, so to get around this problem, the NumPy package provides uh, multi-dimensional arrays for Python. Um, and these arrays are always of a homogeneous type. So if you say, I want an array of integers, you get an array of integers of, the, of, an, of a given uh, bit precision. You can specify particular sizes as necessary. Um, and NumPy also provides uh, operations to act on these, so linear algebra, as well as uh, sort of the more basic arithmetic operations between the uh, arrays, so you can add them, multiply them, divide them, apply um, basic mathematical functions like sine, square root, etc. to them. Uh, yeah, and it's very important to note that all elements of a NumPy array have the same type. So you can create these in several different ways. Perhaps the easiest is to create a Python list that contains the numbers that you want, and then call the NumPy array function to create a new array from this list. So just to talk about this code a little bit, uh, we first import the package uh, as the first line. Uh, so import NumPy, that's the important part. You also note that you can give a synonym to the package, okay? So a shorter name, so we can import NumPy as NP, which is a very common idiom in the scientific uh, community to do this, because saving those three letters of typing is absolutely vital to our productivity as programmers. <laughs> uh, yeah, so to create an array, we, uh, we first of all create, this is in fact a tuple with the Early brackets, uh, round brackets, sorry. Yeah, so the number, the answer is one, two, three, four. And then we pass this to the MP array function that will create an array as its first argument. You can give a second optional argument which tells uh, NumPy what type array to create. Or it can try and figure it out from the, uh, from the types of the passed in values. So here we're creating a float array. Uh, rather than an integer array that uh, NumPy would create by default if we omitted it. So if we print A uh, here, you see it tells us it's an array and it shows you the values that are contained within it. So just below we've got the list one where we're creating a two dimensional array. It's got, we create, uh, we create um, a Python list, which is, is a list of two elements, each of which, which is a list of three elements, and these are just integers in this case, but then when we create the array in the line below, we're telling NumPy to create a list of complex numbers, uh, but to use those values. And then if we print this, you see it's produced something uh, quite sensible, it's got correct real uh, parts, and all the imaginary parts are set to zero as you'd expect. So um, NumPy arrays have several properties which uh, are slightly special uh, attributes that an object can have. Um, the shape, it tells you, well, very simply the shape of the array. So in this case, it's for the mat variable. It's just two by three. 
as you'd expect, and the size tell, is computed from the shape on the fly every time you access the um, property, and uh, you can see that's got six elements as you'd expect. So um, you can also create arrays using various functions built into NumPy. So the A range function uh, takes a, a, a number as its argument, and it will create a uh, it will create a range of values. It's worth mentioning this is exactly the same as the built-in Python function range, except it will give you a NumPy. It will give you an array as its result, rather than a Python list. Uh, so if you give it 10, it will create the numbers from 0 up to, but not including, the second one. Uh, you could also give it further arguments, which give it, act much like a slice. Uh, you can see the documentation for the full lowdown. There's also something called linspace, which will create a linear space uh, values between the maximum and the minimum with the step given. Or sorry, no, the maximum and minimum with the number of values specified. Uh, then finally, you can create ones which have certain values. There's zeros, which will create a given shape array, which is filled with zeros. Ones, which will create the given shape array made entirely of ones. And there's one that's not showing, which is called empty, which is whatever value happens to be in memory at that location, which is fractionally quicker than the others. Um, yeah, so these can be indexed uh, pretty much as you would expect. Uh, if you want to get a single element, you specify the coordinates uh, to get at that part. So for a two-dimensional array, you need to specify, and you want to get a single element, you must specify both the row and the column necessary to get to that point. Uh, the usual Python tricks of negative numbers starting from the end and counting backwards work as do, does slicing, so you can specify a range with a start, stop, and step. <coughs> um, you can also access just one dimension uh, by uh, using a slice over all values in one of the dimensions, one or more of the dimensions, I suppose you should say. Um, it's again, worth reiterating that in Python, all variables are simply references. So a standard assignment from B to A, in this case, will create simply a reference to the same array. That NumPy arrays have a further have a method uh, called copy, which does exactly what you expect and will copy the entire contents of the array to a completely new piece of memory and then return a reference to that in the new variable. Uh, you can also create views, which are arrays that uh, point to subsets of an existing array. So the array C below gives simply a view of elements 1, 2, and 3 in the array A. But again, you can, um, you can copy these if you want to create a completely separate copy of that subpart of the array. So from manipulating arrays, you can reshape them. Um, so you could reshape the matrix, the two by three matrix into a three by two matrix. Um, and you can ravel them, which uh, will flatten the array to 1D. You can also use the method flatten, which perhaps makes more sense. <coughs> okay, you can join arrays together. So we've got two matrices, which are both uh, um, three by two, no, sorry, two by three arrays. You can concatenate them together, and they will be joined along the first axis. So you have a four by three uh, matrix at the end of it. You can specify which axis to use by using the axis uh, optional keyword argument. If you look at the documentation for concatenate, uh, it will be explained. Uh, then you can split arrays into subparts, which is um, obviously useful if you're sharing work between um, subparts of your program or indeed uh, different parallel parts. So split will split array, uh, split your array into a given number of pieces. So in this part three, and you have to specify which axis to split along. 
So for array operations, most uh, numerical operations uh, can be done element-wise automatically. So if you create have two arrays in the same shape uh, and you add them together, it will do exactly what you think, uh, or multiply and divide, etc. They'll work element by element rather than doing a uh, sort of if you had a matrix and a vector and you multiply them together, it would not do a matrix vector multiplication. Uh, there are various special functions um, so that will work element-wise on each on these arrays. So if you take the sign of a NumPy array, it will take the sign of each element individually. So in the example shown in the code below, A is set to be a, li a linear space between uh, minus pi and pi, give with eight values along that, and what he's demonstrating with this first thing, where he's using the built-in maths library of Python on this NumPy array, you get an error uh, because those built-in math functions are only able to deal with built-in Python integers, uh, uh, built-in Python numerical types. Uh, however, NumPy includes uh, functions that are fully aware of NumPy arrays and know how to work on them all. Uh, very efficiently. So, if you take this, use NumPy to take the sign of a long array, it will take basically the same time to do that as if you had written a C program to do that, and then iterate it over each element in your array. Ah, yeah. So this is explaining exactly that. So it's talking about vectorizing operations. So um, for loops in Python, is slow. The reason for this comes down to again the fact that it's a dynamically typed language. So every time it goes around the loop, it has to compare the types of the objects to each other, check that that's a valid comparison, that your loop index is an integer, uh, which can be successfully compared to your uh, loop count. Uh, you know the value is then computed, and then the type of that is checked and seen if it can be a coerced or true or false value, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a slow process. So NumPy gets around this by uh, doing all that at the C or the C level. Um, so in the example here, which is basically just subtracting two arrays, uh, the code written in pure Python versus uh, a NumPy operation is um, a factor of PT in the performance. So um, it's quite similar to MATLAB in that sense. If you've used MATLAB in the past, um, you've got to avoid writing for loops when you're doing uh, numerical work because it's just a lot slower than doing an array operation. So for getting data in and out of your program, NumPy provides uh, some functions that can read and write data to files. Um, for simple text files, which would just be, say, uh, comma separated values or similar. NumPy can read those pretty much automatically with the load txt function that it can save to them. So they only cope with uh, regular column layouts, but it can also cope with comments and different col column delimiters and some funny formatting things. Again, if you read the doc string for the load text function, you can uh, find out more. Uh, it also has functions for various binary formats that are specific to uh, NumPy. And the chat, Andy has just pointed out that NumPy genform text is a better and more flexible option for reading data in columns uh, because it can cope with missing values. So the genform text uh, function is very useful, I would say, but you have to be careful with it because, because it tries to be a bit too smart. Sometimes it can do unexpected things. Uh, but that's, I think, just a difference of style between me and Andy Batts as to why I don't prefer it. Um, another important thing that you need quite often is uh, random numbers. So numpy.random is a sub-module of numpy that provides uh, functions for creating arrays uh, of random values. So you can get uh, numbers that are drawn from different distributions, so you can get uniform deviates or Poisson or um, Gaussian or various other types. Again, uh, Python has a good help system to find out all the details. Um, 
So in this code example, we are importing the numpy.random package as the shorter name rand, uh, and then we can just call the, the random function on that, which will just create a two by two uh, array of random numbers drawn from between zero and one exclusively. And then in the second example, it's doing exactly the same, but from a Poisson uh, distribution. Uh, yeah, so polynomials are quite useful uh, objects as well. Um, so for NumPy, it defines a polynomial as an array of coefficients, uh, p. So p is a set of values and a number, which has the order of the polynomial. Um, you can create these polynomials from uh, doing some sort of fitting, uh, usually by least squares. So that's in the package numpy.polyfit. You can evaluate these. Uh, which is the polyval uh, function, or find roots of these. So in the little code example snippet at the bottom, what we're doing is we're creating uh, our x-axis, which is linear space of from minus 4 to plus 4. Uh, we're setting our y values to be x squared plus a random bit, uh, a bit of noise, and then we try and fit uh, a polynomial to this noisy pseudo data, and then you can see that p gives you an array back, which is the list of coefficients. Excuse me. So if you had an infinite, a perfect fit to this, uh, if the because of the random uh, the random deviates between zero and one with a mean of a half, you expect to get one zero and a half as your uh, polynomial coefficients if you'd taken an infinite number and had a perfect fit. Um, but you see it's got quite close to that, so uh, not bad for seven numbers. Okay, next let's just mention linear algebra. So NumPy can do various uh, matrix vector products efficiently. It can do eigenproblems, solve linear systems, inverse matrix. Um, these work roughly as you would expect. So if you create uh, two by two arrays A and B, uh, you can create C, which is the dot product A and B. Uh, you can create a one dimensional vector length two, and you can solve the system uh, C, CX equals B, and you'll get back some values. Uh, don't know if that's right, I assume so. Okay, right. So, quick mention of word about the performance. So, for the previous example of matrix multiplication, so we're just doing two matrices uh, the same size, dimension 200 times each other. You write a simple Python code to this. Uh, apparently, it takes 5.3 seconds on a given machine. Uh, not great. Um, you write a naive C program to do the same problem. It takes uh, a tenth of a second. Uh, and if you use numpy dot, which is the uh, matrix matrix multiplication function, uh, numpy will do it in only a hundredth of a second. So uh, it's better than a naive C program. So it's not too bad. So just to summarize some key points, uh, numpy gives you a static uh, array of a homogeneous type for storing numerical data. Uh, these can be multidimensional. You can do mathematical operations on these very efficiently and quickly. Um, you can do something called array broadcasting. So if you were, for example, go create some array A of size whatever, and then you add to it the literal number one, it will broadcast the plus one to every single value in that array. There are generalizations of this to work with uh, different dimensioned uh, values. So you could, for example, if you had a, a matrix and a vector, you could add the appropriate value of each element of that vector to a whole row on that matrix if the dimensions match up appropriately. Um, I'm afraid there's not time to do this now. Google uh, NumPy array broadcasting. There are various tools for linear algebra and random numbers included. And to get anything like decent performance, you need to use the top level functions that are supplied uh, by NumPy. So you need to do adding whole vectors together, the whole make, whole arrays together, rather than looping over the individual elements and doing it like that. 
Okay, great. End of part three. Uh, let's try and get to part four. Uh, let's try and skip through this a bit quicker um, because we're starting to run a bit short of time. Okay, don't worry, I'm not going through it that quickly. So Matplotlib, thanks Andy for the slides. Um, so what is it? Matplotlib is a library for plotting, uh, which has been inspired by MATLAB um, for a lot of the syntax and its capabilities. Um, its philosophy is to try and make, make the easy things easy and the hard things possible. Um, yeah, I suppose that's quite fair. Um, it's designed for interactive plotting as well as for producing publication quality figures. I have produced quite a lot of figures using it, so it does work if you uh, are willing to work on the details a little. It's got a very big, a very wide range of functionality. You can do lots of scientific and statistical plots, um, heat maps, contours, surfaces. You can also do geographical and map-based plotting. I've never tried that myself, uh, because I have seen some good pictures that have been prepared of it. And it's, so it's closely integrated with NumPy. I would say that it's built entirely on top of NumPy, and NumPy arrays are its basic data structure. So the basic concept is you issue Python commands to create uh, the elements of your plot. Uh, so you can create the plots and set titles and legends or multiple plots, and then you issue a show command to actually display this. Um, if you've used MATLAB at all, uh, the basic uh, um, way of mode of operation will seem quite familiar to you. Uh, you issue commands to say which subplot you are currently working on, and you issue some plot commands and labeling commands, and then you move on to the next subplot and continue, and then you finally produce the figure. Uh, the default in matplotlib is to plot to the screen, but you can also save to image files with a single command. So quick example is just a random scatter plot. So here, Andy's assuming that we're using IPython in its special PyLab mode. So this would be uh, done by issuing the command shown on screen, so IPython dash PyLab to give it the PyLab option. Then if you just simply issue those three commands within the, in the terminal, you'll get the, a graph much like the one shown. So we create x is a thousand random values, y is a thousand random values, and then we plot them with pluses. Uh, yeah, so figures and subplots. So the entire plot is known uh, as the figure, and within each figure you can have one or more subplots. So the subplots by default are placed onto a regular grid within the figure, but you can control these more finely uh, if you use axes. You can use the subplot command to specify which of the subplots you're going to work on for the uh, following part of your script. So we can do this uh, same scatter plot as before, but we issue it twice after um, selecting subplots one and two. And then we can show the figure, which will produce a picture much like the one on the right. But one of the most important things that you do is you uh, want to create a quick plot from um, some some data that you've got in a file. Um, so um, in the past, most people have probably used GNU plot or a spreadsheet, um, but Matplotlib can actually step into this and uh, do the job for you. The advantage of this is you can then manipulate the data in some uh, relevant way and then replot it, and then save the session to be able to reproduce this uh, uh, graph at a later date. So what you need to do is you need to use NumPy functions to read the data. So uh, in this case, I would actually say that Andy was right, and the gen from text function is uh, the best thing to use because the plotting quick and dirty style. You don't need to worry too much. So what we're doing here is we're generating an array from the text file random1.nat. We create a figure, take, select the first subplot on it, and we plot columns 0 and 1 from that and show the figure. And if you have a suitable random text file available, it will produce that uh, graph. Excuse me. 
so obviously uh, we all know you need to label things. So you can use the X label and Y label label um, commands, which will act on the currently selected subplot. So if you call X, you just pass these strings, and they'll set the X and Y labels appropriately. If you want to set a title for the whole figure, you need to use the fig dot subtitle uh, function that will set uh, set that, where fig is the figure object that you've created earlier, if you see on the previous slide. So it's a method rather than a function, sorry. To create a key or a legend, um, you use the legend uh, function, which will act on the currently set subplot. And to use that, it requires that the label was set for each uh, series that you plotted. OK, so probably the most important uh, one is the saving to a file. Um, you can use the fig.savefig method uh, to save um, to save the uh, a copy of the the figure to uh, the file specified. So you just pass a string specifying the file. The file format is determined from the extension of the uh, file name given. But there are various options, such as setting the DPI, the dots per inch, or the resolution. Uh, exactly what backend, what formats will be supported depends on exactly which version you've got. Um, standard ones are PNGs, JPEGs, PDFs, and PostScript files. Um, sh should be enough. Here are a few quick uh, examples of plots that you can create. Uh, Matplotlib.org slash gallery contains of an awful lot of plots. Some of them. So if you don't quite know how to plot something you want, I suggest you go and have a look there and see if there's something like it, and then copy the commands from there. So to prepare a sort of publication quality image is quite um, onerous uh, to get it just the way you want it. And you may well end up using different settings for each journals because they may have different policies, like font sizing, et cetera, et cetera. So matplotlib is very configurable, and it uses a settings file called matplotlibrc um, to set up things like uh, default fonts and um, file um, sizes of the image, etc. So you can create a settings file for a given journal or your thesis or some internal report or whatever it is, uh, and you can save these somewhere. And you can use the special RC file command built into matplotlib to load the settings specified in that file. Um, yeah. So there are various useful settings that I'm not really going to go into. You can set font sizes, uh, default sizes of the markers, um, use tech to nicely typeset all the labels, etc. Set the width, blah, 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 etc. Um, you may find also that some of the plots have a bit too much white space around them to fit nicely in in your paper. So you can use the type layout um, method on the figure to reduce all the padding, um, and then you can save it as a PDF because that's the most commonly used format. So yeah, um, you use NumPy to get your data in to Matplotlib. Um, plotting syntax is quite simple and concise. If you're an ex MATLAB user, you will find it quite straightforward. Um, uh, if you want to produce a slightly fancier plot, I would say have a look at the gallery. As Andy points out in the chat, all the um, plots in the gallery have the full source code available to, for download and your perusal. So you can start with something there and adapt it to your exact needs. Um, yeah, uh, and the final line is definitely true. The more you use it, the more you'll be able to get out of that, like uh, anything. Right, part four done. OK, this is going to be very brief, because I'm sure you're all bored of my voice by now. OK, SciPy and other packages. So uh, thanks to Arno and the CFC guys again for these slides. OK, so NumPy provides basic ar arrays, basic linear algebra, and things like that. Um, 
SciPy is a sort of a layer on top of that. Um, it's got um, routines for all sorts of things, so numerical integration, solving ODEs, uh, interpolation, linear algebra with full interfaces of LAPAC and BLAS, sparse arrays and linear algebra on those, uh, image processing, optimization, signal processing, stats, all sorts of things, lots of special functions. Uh, oh yeah, and the note at the bottom, there are no PDE solvers included in SciPy, but there's, of course, other packages that can do that for you. So a very quick example of integrating a differential equation. <coughs> I'm not going to sort through, talk through that at all, um, but um, yeah, it's just solving a simple uh, decay equation there. Optimization, you can use quasi-Newton, least squares, simulated annealing, or more general purpose root finding axes to uh, try and um, minimize some error function or whatever. Uh, SciPy has got a massive set of special functions. I counted, uh, I looked at it uh, just before starting this. Um, there are something like 330 different special functions included within the package. So, Bessel uh, functions, as only functions, gamma functions, etc., etc., etc. Uh, you can then plot these quite easily or use them in your code as necessary. Okay, linear algebra. So, um, SciPy includes a much bigger selection of linear algebra routines than does NumPy. So, you can decompose your system's matrix exponentials. Um, there are routines that work on sparse matrices. Um, and um, as I mentioned before, you've got full interface to BLAS and LAPAC. So, anything that you're used to doing with that, you can do through SciPy. A few other relevant packages. Pandas. Um, so this is a, people like a list to R quite a lot, and I'd say that's a fair comparison. It um, have a good implementation of something a bit like a, an R data frame, um, and it's got lots of um, functionality for manipulating these. Simpy is a library for symbolic computing. Scikit image is a, a sort of a, a plug-in module for SciPy for image processing. Scikit Learn is the same for SciPy for machine learning. And Sage is sort of a, a bit like an open source version of uh, Maple or Mathematica. Um, if you're a mathematician, you may find this uh, very good because sort of to create a matrix in that, you have to define your ring uh, over which uh, the fields operate. And my math wasn't good enough to talk about it much. Um, more than that. But it's built entirely in Python. You always have access to the standard Python uh, environment within it. Right, OK, that's the SciPy one. And there's the final part, which is interfacing to uh, Fortran, uh, or indeed C. Uh, OK, right, so um, this is mainly talking about F to Pi which is the Fortran to Python interface. So the reason you might want to do this is that you have some existing code uh, that is written in Fortran or C that already does a, well, a job and you want to build on top of that. Um, and you want to use your Python as a glue to organize the code and dynamically select which problems uh, you're going to study and how you're going to study them. So you want the performance of the compiled code but the flexibility of Python. So maybe you want to use the Python for uh, simulation setup or analysis and visualization, whatever is appropriate for you. And this lets you reuse the sort of well debugged code that you've got already uh, and gradually introduce new pieces uh, written in Python. So the basic uh, thing that you need to interface to a Fortran routine is you need the name of the external function, the types of the arguments that are going to be passed between Python and the external code. You know, are they integers, reals, arrays, characters, whatever. You need the list of the arguments and whether the arguments are for input, output, or uh, in-out arguments. You need to package that up in a way that uh, can be uh, interfaced to by the Python interpreter. And F2Pi is a program that provides a way to do this very simply. 
So for interfacing to Fortran, um, you just need to provide the source code um, ready to be compiled and a file that describes the external functions and the arguments. And that supply can uh, automate uh, creating this for you. So for this very simple example, it's going to uh, have a function that will take the square root of an array of numbers. So we have a simple Fortran uh, subroutine that takes the um, size, an input array, and an output array. Uh, so they're reals. So we give the input and output arrays of reals. And the code simply loops over each element, taking its square root, assigning it to the output array. So to create the signature file, uh, Ectopy will have a pretty good stab at doing this for simple problems for you itself. So you just run that on your Fortran file. You specify with the dash m object what the Python module should be called and where to put the signature. Sorry, I've just been uh, given a message, sorry. OK. Uh, yeah, so, sorry, where was I? So you, it will output your sig the signature file, which describes to f to pi how to package everything up for you into the pi f file. That's what the h option does, specifies where to output it to. So once you have checks that that signature file is correct. I'll explain in a moment. Uh, you then use f to pi to compile the library, uh, co to compile, sorry, the Fortran source code into a library that can be imported into Python. So the command line is just shown here. Uh, so you just say dash c, the uh, description file, and then the source code files that need to be compiled together. This will then produce a library that will have a name uh, which matches the module name that you gave at the previous step, dot so uh, shared object, so a standard uh, um, shared library file, which can then be imported into Python to um, access the code. So within the Python interpreter, um, you just import the module. So from the module FRA import the function array square root, import numpy as numpy, create an array, uh, and then pass that array into the array square root function, and then it does indeed return the correct square root for you. So that was relatively painless. Uh, to interface to C, um, it's a little more painful because uh, FSPI can't figure out the interface files for you. You have to write them by hand. And you also must use the intent C attribute for all variables. Um, uh, and you must define the function name with the intent C attribute as well. Um, most importantly, um, the C interface can only deal with one dimensional arrays. So if you want to deal with multi dimensional arrays, you have to do the array fit, the index fiddling yourself in the C function. So you may need to write a simple wrapper function around your uh, underlying library. However, bearing in mind that, apart from those differences, uh, it's built in exactly the same way. So you have to write your interface file yourself. So here's the syntax. Um, you say it's a Python module with a given name. You start the interface block. You declare the subroutines, uh, much as if they were Fortran uh, subroutines and then you end these things. Um, again, uh, I'm sorry I'm rushing through this. If you want to learn the details properly, I'll have to, you'll have to look on the web or find another course. Uh, yeah, and then you compile that in exactly the same way as the last step of uh, the Fortran example. So you would do exactly the same, except that would have array square root dot c in the last part. So for dealing with C, there are various other options. So you can use the native Python uh, interface, which is very, very flexible, but it's also uh, is very, very verbose, and it's prone to seg faulting if you make the slightest mistake. 
um, better options are Python, which is where you write C like Python. You take an existing piece of Python code and you annotate it with uh, type definitions. And then this code is processed and compiled into C. Well, yeah, it's translated into a C source code, which is uh, then compiled. Uh, unlike Andy, I've had a lot of success using Cypen. If you have some uh, an application written entirely in Python and it's just too slow, you figure out which inner loops are too slow, and you can you can very easily adapt it to Cypen and get a massive speed up of that code. Um, finally, there's Swig, which stands for something I can't quite remember, but basically you write an interface file that describes your software, and this can be either C or C++, and uh, you can map this into a scripting language. Um, it supports quite a wide variety of scripting languages. I think it's something like 20 in total, but um, the only ones that are commonly used are uh, Python, Ruby, and Lua, as far as I am aware. Um, Uh, yeah, um, writing these interface files can be a little tricky. It's quite advanced uh, technique to use this, but uh, I've had some success doing this, and I know quite a few large um, C and C++ libraries have had success using this to make their software available from, from within a Python session. Right, so very brief summary. Um, XPy, a very simple way to call Fortran code, especially from Python, also C code. Um, the syntax has changed slightly from the Fortran style to something a bit more Pythonic, as in uh, in the Python style way of doing things, and you can thereby get much better performance than writing the code naively in Python. Okay, so um, that's all the slides dealt with. Um, what I'm going to do now is just uh, open things up for any questions and discussion that uh, people may want to have. Uh, you can ask either by voice or uh, in the chat window. Right, okay, so, oh, I've got several questions here already. Uh, I'll just start at the top. So, Harvey, um, you say, does the multi NumPy multidimensional array element format order match Fortran? By default, no. By default, it works uh, in C style. However, you can set the Fortran flag to true when you create your arrays to make it uh, follow Fortran ordering. Um, I'm afraid I'm just going to have to refer you to the documentation or come, come ask me. Uh, I hope that's OK, Harvey. Uh, right, Dan, you. Uh, you mentioned I.O. with text files. Could you say a bit more about I.O. with binary files? Sure. So you can always, it is a full feature program language. You can directly read uh, binary data from a file with Python and create your own readers and writers um, for custom data formats. If you have a very simple data format, um, then you can sometimes just directly mmap the file uh, to access that data. Um, but if you have a particular binary format in mind, it is worth a Google to see if someone has already written an interface for you. If it's just for your own code, which is uh, you know only used by three research groups, I'm afraid one of you guys is probably going to have to write it. Um, but presumably you've written readers and writers in a compiled language already, so it should be much easier to re-implement that in Python. Um, does that answer your question? Okay, right. Andy, um, is there support for parallel computing in Python? So, Built into Python, there is only very, very limited support. Um, in the standard library, assuming you are on uh, a POSIX machine, 
uh, so uh, Linux and Mac, you have access to the multi-threading and the multi-processing libraries, which allow for uh, um, sort of OS-level threads and um, processes. Um, so you can use all the cores available on one node using the built-in standard library. It's important to note for this that the threading implementation in Python, so when you have multiple threads within one process, uh, there's something called the global interpreter lock in Python, which means that the um, performance you would get from threading is abysmal unless you have a lot of uh, basically I.O. operations. Um, because within one Python process, there is a master lock that is a, a, uh, has to be held by the active thread to actually execute Python code rather than calls out to the OS the system calls. Um, but beyond the standard library, there's something called MPI for Pi, which I think I mentioned right at the very, very start, um, which is an interface to the message passing interface library that you know, you know and love from uh, parallel computing uh, available to the right program. So that has um, code available for all the usual things like sends, receives, broadcasts, and it also has um, help for defining data types to pack up your data from Python objects, send it over, pack it up into a binary uh, message, send that over the network interface to the other process and then unpackage that into a proper Python object at the other end. Um, oh, and it's also worth mentioning that, of course, you know, you can do a lot of network programming with Python. So you can open a, a regular socket to another Python process and throw data at it and receive data back from it. Uh, that's um, enough, Andy. Okay, cool. Okay, so Ariadna, uh, is it important to specify which version of Fortran I used in my code when I want to transform into Python? Um, I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, I think it's important to note that you're not transforming your code into Python. You are making that code accessible from Python. Uh, um, so the, the source code that actually executes is exactly the code that you've written already. Uh, it's just that the arguments provided to it are sent in from Python rather than from the, another part of the Fortran program. Um, I think you'll have to check the F2P documentation uh, about which versions of Fortran are available. I think it can probably cope with most modern versions of Fortran. But You'd have to check, I'm afraid. Right, um, so that's uh, enough of an answer. OK, Gavin, so can I recommend a URL for using Python for workflows, i.e. launching parallel Fortran code, for example, then pressing out, but then launching another parallel code. Hmm. No, I've never used a sort of a workflow type thing personally. I'm aware that people have written them. Um, for workflow tools, I'm I'm not aware of any particular ones, um, but. Actually, there's something called Ganga, I believe, that's available uh, that's quite good for sort of interfacing to batch systems. Um, no, I'm afraid I don't know any particular ones for that problem. But uh, I've used something uh, called Fabric um, for um, running jobs on remote uh, resources and then fetching the results back and then analyzing them locally. Uh, and it makes that very simple. So it's like 
I had the program name, machine name, problem name, and it will just uh, execute that for you. And then you can go fab machine name fetch results, and it will bring them all back to your local machine, and fab analyze the problem name, and it will produce a, a summary file for me for that. And that's entirely written in Python. Yes, that's the URL, Gavin. But it doesn't exactly match your problem. Sorry, I've never, um, I've never wanted to use that myself, so I can't recommend one. Okay, happy to happy to try and help. Um, it may be worth looking on the Python website because they have a lot of um, descriptions of packages that are available. So if you go to um, the URL I'm about to type in into the chat window, that may be some help. Uh, it's got the Python package index and it's got um, many tens of thousands of uh, packages available in a searchable format. So maybe just searching workflow library Python may find what you want. Right. Any more questions? Okay, well, if no one's got any more questions, um, the slides and the recording of this will be available soon on the virtual tutorials page on Archers, and the, the Python slides that I've shown are currently available online, they should be online already at the URL, I'm just going to paste in there. Oh, uh, some people have asked some more questions, uh, okay. Um, Andy, can you interface to C with CPython? Yes, so I mentioned very briefly um, that you could do in this uh, the last set of size about F to Pi. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so a lot of people like this as the simplest way to interface C to Python. Um, if you have a relatively simple API in C, then Swig is probably by far the most fully functional way of doing that. Um, uh, if you want to get, and it's also very good for uh, if you really must have the full features of your uh, C or C++ available from Python. It can be very, very useful for that. Um, yeah, um, Siphon is also, can also interface to external C code. Um, I slightly prefer Swig, personally. But, um, other people will disagree with that. Nicholas asks, uh, is Python any good for GUI development? Um, yes, it is any good for GUI development. Uh, there are quite a lot of sort of toolkits for widgets. Um, so I've used um, the uh, Python interface to WX Windows um, to write simple GUI applications, um, and that works pretty well. Um, it won't be as quick and responsive as if you wrote your application in, uh, I don't know, uh, something a bit more compiled, like C or you know, if you're Windows Phone C Sharp or um, Objective C for the Mac heads. Um, but yeah, you can definitely write a decent GUI using Python. Um, it's perfectly possible. Okay, well, you're welcome. Um, Okay, so if there are no more questions, um, I'll sign off unless everyone gets on with their afternoons. Um, yeah, I'll stay online for a couple more minutes just if anyone's got any more questions. Um, but thanks very much for uh, your attention. I hope it's been useful and that you want to start using Python in your um, in your science. Um, I'm happy to take questions via email. Uh,
at any point, or if you send them to the Archer CSE team, uh, you can probably get some help there. Right. I'm going to turn my video off, but I'm going to keep the chat window open for a little while in case people have questions. Cheers. Bye.